A few years ago, I made this video. It shows a basic overview of how I use an inexpensive chainsaw mill to produce some fairly expensive lumber. I tried to cover some specifics, but overall it was more of a bird's eye view of chainsaw milling in general. And then, some time later, I made another video. And this time, the subject matter was about me building my stationary sawmill. Still using a chainsaw bar and chain, but with more powerful electric motors. The theme of that video did perhaps end up being more about achieving your goals and how seemingly insignificant decisions can put you on an unexpected path and completely change your life. Now, doesn't that sound like a movie you want to watch? Oh, and if you do, I totally messed up the audio levels and the music is a little bit too loud. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, I never got to dive really deep into the specifics that time either. And what became apparent to me is that chainsaw milling is actually a pretty popular topic. And after making these videos, I have gotten a ton of questions on this topic. I try and reply to the best of my ability, but for some time I have been really wanting to make another video that really takes a close look at the topic of chainsaw milling. And that is what I have done. My initial idea was to make two videos. One in which I would bring up all these questions that I've gotten over the years and try and fill it with as much info as I possibly could for people who want to learn about this. And the second video would be about putting this info to use and sawmilling a nice big log. So I got my camera all set up. I made a nice little scene with some slabs and chainsaw bars in the background. I got my notes all ready and I went right into the most popular question, which in essence was chainsaw versus bandsaw. Now, there are so many nuances to this question. So as I try and answer, it has really turned into a video all on its own. So instead of two videos, this will be the first out of three. So without any further ado, enjoy the video. So let's just uh, give you some introduction here, uh, why I'm chainsaw milling right now when I have my stationary mill. And let's just say it's been a rough winter for my loader. So it's been at the mechanics for quite a few weeks now. It had a bunch of uh, problems, a few issues there with some hydraulic oil leaking everywhere and <laughs> stuff like that. But you know, uh, the weather has turned. We are now in spring. Uh, it is now the beginning of May and um, having my loader at the mechanics is not gonna stop me from sawing up some nice logs. So this is the perfect opportunity for me to make uh, this type of video where we can uh, dive a little bit deeper, answering your most frequently asked questions uh, and what makes this a viable option for some people. So let's just uh, jump right into my first uh, point here or my first uh, most frequently asked question and that is why chainsaw milling? Let's look at my situation here for a little bit. I try and find large trees that are already being cut down in urban areas for whatever reason. And these are often extremely big timbers, as you can see here in this clip. And this way of doing it has worked out really good for me to get access to some of the best and most unique hardwoods that I normally would never even be able to buy at a supplier. And some of this wood is absolutely incredible. And most of the time, it is because the trees were really old. And old trees produce the best grain and figure and color as well. If you want to cut these timbers into full width slabs, then you are left with two options. And that is a bandsaw mill or a chainsaw mill. And most people who first get into sawmilling in general have to decide between these two types of sawmills as well. Now over the years, this topic of bandsaw versus chainsaw has been heavily debated among sawyers. 
It might even be a little bit controversial. But since we are taking a hard look at summoning in this video, it only makes sense to begin here. Let me just give you some of the main reasons of why I opted for chainsaw milling. And number one, my logs are very dirty. You can almost 100% of the time expect to be hitting nails, bullets, horseshoes and those types of things. Um, concrete uh, wire, fencing wire and just all kinds of things are inside trees. Uh, they are also very large. It's not that a bandsaw is not able to handle that, but you're gonna need a very expensive bandsaw to handle that. Well, the blue stain never lies. So, as suspected, we got ourselves something nasty down here. Then we also had a nail over there. And, but firstly, I hit these two. So yes, logs from yard trees are often filled with metal, but fortunately, it is mostly nails. The trees are typically between the age of 100 to 250 years old. So it would be an absolute shock if during all those years, no one ever thought to put a nail in the tree. So yeah, people like to attach objects to their trees, but that's okay. We can deal with that. And as I said, most of the times it's only a few nails here or there. And nails, they are fairly soft. But if you hit a screw, however, well, then you're screwed. <laughs> well, sometimes you are. But yeah, screws are a lot tougher than nails. And oftentimes people make the argument that a chainsaw chain can handle cutting through metal better than bandsaws. And maybe that's true, but I still find that I ruin a lot of saw chains anyway when cutting through metal. So I don't think that is a very relevant point. But what is relevant, however, is the cost of repairs. Because saw chain is repairable. If you have a few cutters that get damaged, you can either replace them fairly quickly, or if there's minor damage, you can grind them back a little bit with a chain grinder. Tools and equipment for chainsaw milling is fairly inexpensive and easy to use, which is a big plus for chainsaw milling. For bandsaws, you really need a machine that does both the sharpening and corrects the set of the teeth. And these cost a little bit more money. The two main uh, overpowering arguments for why the bandsaw mill is so much better better than the chainsaw mill is two reasons mainly uh, cutting speed and the size or the, or the thickness of the kerf and the kerf is how much wood uh, the cutter removes when it's making its cut so a bandsaw blade is, is fairly thin and a chainsaw chain is fairly thick uh, but None of those reasons really matter that much for me. I am a one-man show here. Uh, I do all of the work all by myself, all of the time. So the, the majority of the time that I spend when sawmilling is actually just moving stuff around and uh, moving slabs, moving logs, you know, taking care of the waste. Uh, topping off the oil, the fuel and everything, uh, taking photographs, measuring and stuff like that. So there's a lot of time that is spent in between the cuts, really. So if, uh, if it takes me five minutes to make a cut or if it takes me a minute and a half, it doesn't really affect the end of the day that much. And curve size, not that much either, since I'm uh, doing a fairly thick slabs between two and three inches. And you gotta keep in mind that both the top and the bottom cut uh, are waist cuts anyway, it doesn't really matter. And the bandsaw does have one uh, big downside to it. And I see it on um, lumber that I purchase. I purchase hardwoods from, from a supplier and sometimes I see, and, and most of that stuff is bandsaw cut. And sometimes you see on a nice piece of oak or something where the, there's been a big branch, a big knot, and the bandsaw blade does a little dip. And in those instances, that really defeats the purpose of having a small curve. Because if you need to plane away three or four millimeters anyway, just to get rid of that little dip that the bandsaw blade made, uh, well then, that doesn't really make any sense. So that's why... I think chainsaw milling works really well because f for a very limited amount of effort or tools the, the chainsaw bar is going to stay nice and straight even if the chain is a little bit dull. So you never really have to worry about messing it up.
So, hello YouTube and all the people out there in cyberspace. <laughs> and this is actually kind of a funny story. Uh, before I built my, my large stationary mill, I was actually about to make a bandsaw mill. This bandsaw really needs a lot of work. But the thing I've been thinking about recently is maybe converting this thing into a sawmill. We have this giant band wheels here. But it wasn't really functioning that well for a woodworking bandsaw. The blade guys were just non-existent basically. So I decided to scrap it and get a better bandsaw for my woodworking. So it's gonna be pretty exciting, I think. This was a few months before I built my electric chainsaw mill. And in the midst of all this, I was heavily debating with myself whether I should continue working on this bandsaw or to spend my time and money upgrading my already functioning chainsaw mill. And I must admit that this bandsaw was very tempting. This ancient machine was built like a tank. All of the shafts and the bearings, they were extremely heavy duty. And also the band wheels were very, very large. Just the perfect size for the size timber I was milling. If I was to buy all of these parts brand new, I would be looking at spending many thousands of dollars and here they were basically free. But a bandsaw blade used for sawmilling huge hardwood logs are not the same as the blades you typically use on a bandsaw like this for woodworking. They are tiny in comparison and they don't require anywhere near the amount of tension compared to sawmilling blades. If I could prove that this old bandsaw actually could perform as a sawmill using the right blade and achieving the right amount of tension needed to make nice and straight cuts through really wide, big pieces of hardwood. Well then, maybe it could work. Look at the blade tension meter. See, I have it written down as well. Around 18,000 psi, which would convert to somewhere in the range of 117 to 125 megapascals. And uh, 18,000 psi, that's just, they, they say it can fluctuate. And so that's why I got this number here. Uh, but that's for one and a half inch blade. And this is two inches, so. I don't know, we're gonna need a little bit more. It's getting up there, but it takes a lot more force than the inch and a half blade. There we go. Right, so we got the proper tension. That's exciting. Bearing action feels really smooth. I am not hearing any crunchy noises whatsoever from any of this so I would assume that the bearings are good uh, but this is under a lot of tension right now but at least what this proves to me is that this might not be too dumb of an idea so I might have to pursue this oh it's gonna be a lot of work a lot of welding I came across a 20 horsepower electric motor uh, last year and I also purchased some some blade guides as well uh, blades and some linear rails and stuff like that so that I can do all the mechanics and everything it could be ready with a few weeks work to be used as a I would assume a fairly productive bandsaw mill I included this story to highlight the gracefulness of the bandsaw the thickness of this blade is only 1.1 millimeters. That is super tiny. 
And yet a well-tuned bandsaw is capable of pulling off straight cuts in some of the biggest and strongest hardwoods, with great speed and efficiency all thanks to the tiny thickness of this blade. The key to this is putting it under high tension. I had around 25,000 psi of tension in this blade. And you can go even higher than that, which will make it even more stable when cutting. But at 25,000 psi, the steel beam that everything is attached to had taken on a slight bend. And I know, high beams are a little bit flimsy, but that is still a pretty heavy piece of steel. So I'm sure you can imagine this whole assembly is being put under some fairly high tension right now. And this is partly why you need very large wheels. The high tension acts as a magnifier on microscopic fractures or imperfections in the steel of the blade. And smaller band wheels make a much tighter radius, causing more of a bend in the blade as it travels around the wheels. This is fine for smaller blades, but not so much for 2 inch wide blades as a tight radius will increase the risk of it breaking. Now both the shafts and bearings are also put under some heavy load due to the tension. And this is also why you want large diameter wheels. How fast the blade travels is a very important factor when sawmilling, and for bandsaws, this is determined by the peripheral speed of the wheels. So with a large diameter wheel, you can achieve the correct speed at a lower RPM, reducing the wear and tear on shafts and bearings, which are common points of failure on sawmills. But even if we put a lot of tension on the blade, and we get all the components to handle that tension without a problem, the blade is never going to be completely stiff. You can still bend it up and down without too much effort. And that is why guide rollers must be a part of the assembly. And these help guide the blade and keep it straight when cutting. These need to be adjustable in all directions. And you also need to make sure that the band wheels are adjustable as well. This is to have the blade track properly on the wheels. If you don't achieve the proper tracking, then the blade can very well come off during operation, and that would be really terrifying. All this is not by any means rocket science, and building a small bandsaw mill is actually pretty easy. But as you go up in size, the curve of difficulty grows exponentially. And here is where I want to make the comparison to the chainsaw mill, which has a much more linear curve. And that is all thanks to its huge flaw that everyone likes to point out, aka the thick curve. Since a chainsaw bar is so much thicker than a bandsaw blade, it is going to remain flat no matter what you do basically. And if you want to build a really big chainsaw mill, then all you basically need to do is just to buy a very long chainsaw bar. The takeaway from this chapter of the video is this. And I'm not trying to lift chainsaw milling to something that it isn't, while simultaneously talking down on bandsaw milling. The reality is that bandsaw mills are better. Despite some of its shortcomings, it is better at almost all aspects of milling. But for some applications, chainsaw milling can be just as viable. And when I see on forums or in comments or whatever, people who are obviously experienced sawyers who then reply to people, newbies or newcomers who are asking a legitimate question about chainsaw milling 
only to be met with a sarcastic reply about how someone should not even waste their time on it. Now, I just can't stand to think that if that person might get discouraged enough to not even give it a try. And so if we as peers don't empower people and give them the correct advice, uh, then uh, I, I think we're doing them a disservice. At the end of the day, the truth is that any sawmill is better than no sawmill at all.